We're going on to our next speaker, Professor Hanor Sandrovich from Bar Ilan University, who's going to tell us about competent cystic fibrosis computational studies on CFTR. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about cystic fibrosis. This is a rare disease. Uh, this is child related, but this is not an early degenerative disease. Sorry. So, what is cystic fibrosis? First of all, this is the most common inherited disease in people from European descent. A number of CF patients is estimated at about 90,000 worldwide, about 700 of them are in Israel. The median survival age of CF patients is only 40, despite many efforts throughout the years. So many CF patients die a childhood. And the disease results in pathologies in many organs, but primarily the lungs. And CF is caused by mutation to the CFTR chloride channel. So there are two points which are highlighted here, mutations and CFTR. So what is CFTR? CFTR is an ABC transporter. So ABC transporter is a family of membrane transporters uh, and they are found in prokaryote and eukaryote and they are respons responsible for transferring cargoes within the cell, uh, outside the cell and into the cell. Uh, CFTR is unique in this uh, family because it is the only ABC transporter which functions as a channel. It's a chloride channel. In fact, it is the largest chlorine channel in the body. And here's a cartoon of CFTR. So this is the membrane. These are two membrane spanning domain and the chloride conductance channel is somewhere in here. Now there are two NBDs. NBD stands for nucleotide binding domain and the role of these NBDs is to bind ATP and hydrolyze ATP. And in doing so, they control the opening and closure of the channel. This is called gating. This is an ion channel. It can, trans it can conduct ions only when it is open. So the opening and the closure are controlled by a hydrolysis and binding of ATP. And here in this region, this is the most common CF causing mutation. It's called f 5 oic del and it's found in this NBD1. This is the gating cycle of CFTR, and I'm not going to go into it. I just want to point out that CFTR, as it goes through its gating cycle, it adopts many conformations. And we really don't know which of these conformations is sensitive to the binding of a so-called CFTR modulator, which I'm going to talk about in a second. So the second point which I highlighted was mutation. And CFTR, there are over 2,000 known CFTR mutations, and over 300 of them were confirmed to be CF causing. Unfortunately, only 13 were confirmed to be non CF causing, and we don't know about the rest. There is a huge ongoing effort in a database, which is called in a team, which is called the CF, CFTR2 team. Now, all this mutation comes in different types and flavors. Some of them disrupt the formation of the protein. So, CFTR bearing this mutation does not get to the cell membrane, so no protein. Some of them are missense mutation, which impair the gating of the channel. So there is CFTR in the channel, uh, so there is CFTR in the membrane, but it doesn't gate properly, it doesn't conduct chloride properly. But irrespective of the nature of the mutation, they all compromise the ability of CFTR to conduct chloride ions. And the fair question then would be, what does chlorine conductance has to do with cystic fibrosis? And I'm going to start this video in a second, it's a short video, but I'm just going to tell you the following. You'll see in a minute that when CFTR is impaired, either it's not present in the cell membrane, or it is present but it doesn't properly conduct chloride ions, this impairs the balance between ion and liquid in the cells. And in the cells which, uh, high, which uh, line the lungs, there is a mucus layer. And when this balance is interrupted, the mucus layer gets dehydrated you get a sticky mucus layer which cannot be cleared from the body. And if it's not cleared by the, from the body, it is being colonized by bacteria. So people suffering from CF get lung infection, and then chronic lung infection, and then lung, lung failure, and eventually death. And while this is a multi-organ uh, problem, most CF patients actually die from lung failure. So I'm going to take you into a quick tour of the lungs. Hopefully this, will, yeah, this is working. And we are going to turn left in a second and zoom into the cells which are lining the airways. 
This is the mucus layers, and these small organelles are called cilia, and they are continually beating, clearing the mucus away. And in this case, all is fine. You'll see CFTR in a second. This is CFTR. Chloride is moving. Water is moving. The mucus layer, which is up here, is hydrated, and then you can clearly, and then you can easily remove it from the body. In a second, you'll see what happens when CFTR is impaired. So, chloride is not moving, water is not moving, this mucus layer on top gets dehydrated, it gets sticky, it cannot be cleared from the body anymore, the cilia stop their action, mucus sits over there, and this small dot, which you'll see in a second, are bacteria colonies. So this is the essence of cystic fibrosis. So the main treatment hypothesis is that if we can restore chloride conductance to normal level, we can ameliorate most of the defects of cystic fibrosis. And because there are two, basically there are two types of mutation, which, which cause a no protein to be in the cell membrane, and, watch, and, and another which cause an impaired protein to be at the cell membrane, there are two a treatment hypotheses. One of them is chemical chaperones called CFTR correctors. And the idea here is to, is to somehow solve the folding defect and get more channels into the cell membrane. The other one is CFTR potentiator. This treatment is, works for, cell, for channels which are already at, cell, at the cell membrane, but they don't gate properly. And this potentiator increases the open probability of the channel and by doing so, they allow more chloride to move through the channels. But pretty quickly, people realized that a single compound is not going to work. So people were talking about this kind of magic bullet, a dual acting compound, never found any. And then they started working on combo therapies. One, one compound, which would be, for example, a corrector, put more channels at the cell membrane. The other one would be a potentiator, which would potentiate these channels. And People started about talk, with talking about sorry, talking about dual therapies. So this compound over here, it's called Evacaftor or Kaleidico or VX770. It's a compound by Vertex, and this was the first compound, this first small molecule, orally available small molecule approved by the FDA uh, for people suffering from a specific mutation, G551D. Problem with this mutation, it affects only about five percent of the patient population. So at that point, 95% of patient population remained with no treatment, except of symptomatic treatments. And then people started working on combo therapy. This was the first combo therapy approved, a combination of a, of a potentiator and a corrector called Lumacaftor. This is applicable to more patients, but while this is a great drug, this combination is not that great. And then Vertex came with this combination, another corrector, which is actually very similar to this. This is also FDA approved. Uh, this is also not a great drug. And now Vertex is talking about a triple combination of compounds. We'll see what's happened. Phase two clinical trials looks good until now. Uh, interesting point. All these compounds came into the, clinic, into the clinic without any animal model, just cells and toxicity. This is a rare disease. And when these compounds were developed, there was actually no animal model. Now there are beginning to be animal models, a pig model, a ferret model, and so on and so forth. Okay. Where do these compounds bind? No one knows. I mean, there are hypotheses, but really no one knows. And the reason no one knows is the following. See if there is a membrane protein. Membrane protein are notorious in their ability to be crystallized. Until now, no one was able to generate a crystal structure of CFTR. In the absence of crystal structure, people have been developing what is known as homology modeling. These are models of the protein. They are based on structure of similar ABC transporters, but they are not of C I mean, they are models of CFTR, but they are only models. And you see there here many models because each of them maybe correspond to a different state in the gating cycle of CFTR. Again, we don't know if any of these models are completely correct. We don't know if any of these models are relevant to anything. However, uh, two years ago, December 2016, the first structure of CFTR became available. This is this structure over here. This is not a crystal structure. This came from cryo-electron microscopy. 
pretty reasonable resolution, 3.7 angstrom. And after this structure, and, and, and this was actually a huge achievement. And then people realized that the structure of CFTR could be solved. Here are the six structures which are currently available. Only these two were rigorously published. These two are in a bioarchive, and these two, I know they exist, and I got permission to show them, not published yet. So different labs, different construct, different protocol, different conformation with different resolutions. Is any of this relevant to anything? It's a great question. We don't know the answer. No structure was resolved under true physiological condition. All the structure were solved under cryo-EM, which, which means low temperature, not cell membrane, some kind of deter detergent. All structure are snapshot. And this is an important point, both for cryo-EM and crystallography. The things you get from the PDB are snapshot. Proteins are dynamic entities. We'll say something about it in a minute. Which, uh, which structure represent a conducting state? We don't know. Four of the structure do not have channels or continuous channels. They are closed structure or nearly open structure. Which structure is sensitive to ligand binding? We don't know because we still don't have any structure solved in the presence of a ligand. Many unanswered questions. And then there is a very interesting question. What are these structures good for? Now, for basic science, the answer is obvious. We like structure, we can use structure. From a drug development perspective, this is an interesting question, because CFTR modulators have been developed prior to the availability of the structure. All the FDI drugs, which I've shown you, did not use the structure in their development. So people are wondering, we have, we have compounds, we have uh, CFTR modulators, do we really need the structures? My claim is that yes, we do need the structures, but uh, and there are a lot of things you can do with them. But I'm going to focus on only one thing. What do the mutations do? As I said, there are over 2,000 mutations, over 300 confirmed to be CF causing. Can we use the structure to tell something about the mechanism of action of the mutation? Uh, and if we can, this may lead us in the develop to, into development of mutation-specific therapies, maybe personal medicine. So here is the first case. This is an interesting mutation. It is found in a Jewish CF patient of Georgian descent. Not that many patients. I, I was approached by Dr. Meir Meizaha from the Schneider Hospital. He said, I have a cohort of about 20 uh, CF patients which are characterized by this mutation. It leads to a rather mild uh, phenotype of the disease, but it's CF causing. What does the, what do the mutation do? So we took the structure which were available and we did an in silico mutation to just to introduce this mutation. What you see here is a view from the top of the structure. And these are the two lysine residue which replace these two original residue. And just three minutes? Okay. Uh, and just by looking at this, uh, you see that these two mutations perturb into the channel. And maybe this is just a steric effect. But there is another important thing here. These are lysine residues. And under physiological pH, lysine is positively charged. Now we're talking about the chloride channel, which conduct negative charge. So perhaps the introduction of strong positive charge into the in, inside the channel somehow blocks, or um, not blocks, but slows down the movement of chloride ion. But, okay. This analysis is based on a static picture. I just told you that CFTR is, the, if, is dynamics. You don't believe me? You still don't believe me? Now you do believe me. So this is a molecular dynamic simulation of CFTR. It is a moving protein. And when protein moves, binding site opens up, other binding site shut down. It's interesting. Uh, there are two purposes for this, to frighten you consider yourself frightened, but to show you that molecular dynamics, the tool which we use to study protein motion, has a mathematical basic behind it. I don't have time to go into all the details, but I want to say just one thing about this. Over here, this is one of our most favorite means of manipulating or analyzing MD simulation. This is called a RMSF potential or a RMSF profile. 
you have the residues on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, you have how they fluctuate. And there is a good correlation between thermal stability of proteins and the amount of fluctuate. They fluctuate. And this is something which we calculated a while ago. There is a very nice correlation between thermal stability and fluctuation. And using this, we can look at what mutation do. And I'll give you just one example because I don't have more time. You are missing the nice example. Okay. So this is this is wild type CFTR, and we can do MD simulation on this, and we can get what seems to be reasonable results. The protein is the the, pro, the protein is fluctuating. There are certain fluctuations which are higher in the cytosolic region more than in the TM, and this makes sense because the TM there are lipids there, so uh, the the structure is not free to move. This is one inward facing conformation. This is another one. And we got what we expect. And the fact that we got what we expect allows us to use this for another simulation. So P P67 L CFTR. This is a CF causing mutation sensitive to a potentiator and a corrector. The, the mutation occurs here in the end terminal of the residue. If you look at this fluctuation profile, you are com here we are comparing fluctuation profile of the mutant with those of the wild type. So whenever you see values above the zero, this means that the mutant fluctuate to a higher degree than the wild type. What you see here that the introduction of this mutation destabilizes one of the domain. This is NBD2. This is a second domain. So there is a huge allosteric effect here. Mutation happens in one place, destabilizes the protein in other places. That's interesting. There are what are no reverent mutation. We can re and this is, by the way, in agreement with experimental data. The reverent mutation, or uh, sorry, reverent mutation. You put a second mutation and you reduce the effect of the first one. We did it in the lab. I mean, our collaborator did it in the lab, and this mutation rescues the effect of this mutation. We also see it in the simulation. The degree of, fluctu of fluctuation goes a little bit down. This mutation is a stabilizing mutation, and we see it both in experiment and in the lab. And the last point about this mutation, this is also a gating mutation. This means that the association between the two NBDs are not very good in this mutant. This is the distance between the, between the two NBDs in the wild type and in the mutant. And you see that the distance between the two NBDs is larger in the mutant in accord with the agreement, uh, sorry, with the hypothesis that this is a gating mutation. I will not, I don't have time to go into another mutation. Uh, I will just leave you with this mutation. If you, uh, with this, sorry, uh, uh, with, with this slide, if you analyze the trajectory, you can suggest site for the binding of known CFTR modulator. And we have done it, and we have found one potential site here, one here, and one here. And this site or the position of this site are in general agreement with experimental data. Whether these are the correct site, we still don't know. We are now working on studying these proteins. Uh, within these uh, ligands bind to them. So, note by the way that one of my students trains CFTR2 both to the audience, so this is what it does here. Uh, CFTR structure are useful, although you can develop drugs without them. They can be used to interpret the data, and structures are great hypothesis generator, but then you need to test them. Uh, they're useful for drug design, more structure are needed, they are on the horizon, we know that people are working on them, and simulations, MD simulation, provide insight into the mode of action of how protein works and into the mode of action of mutations. And for specific mutation, we were able to get uh, data with good agreement with experiment. These are all the people who are doing the work, I just get to talk about it, but they are doing the work. Uh, and I want to thank all the members of the CFTR consortium. I've been a member of this consortium for about 10 years. Funding came from these uh, agencies. And thank you for your attention. Questions? Uh, from the simulations, can you conclude about the uh, genotype-phenotype relationship? Can you see mutations that are expected to have more severe phenotype than others? In principle, we can try. 
uh, but, we, but we need to get some information. If you give me a certain mutation, or a certain substitution in the sequence, I can try to speculate on what it does. I can try to speculate on whether it stabilizes, destabilizes, whether it impairs gating. But computations, MD simulation are time consuming. I cannot screen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mutations using MD simulations. At least maybe others can't, can, I can't with my computational resources. But if you give me a hypothesis, I can try to <coughs> test it. Thank you very much.